Hey, good afternoon. It is a dreary Monday. It's nice and cloudy outside. Um, got the American Revolution today, and you actually get two wars for the price of one. We have to start with something called the Seven Years' War, which was really the first big global war. Um, you get fighting in North America, South America, Europe. You even get fighting in China and India with the Seven Years' War. And it lasts from 1756 until 1763. Now, the North American portion is better known as the French and Indian War to us, but it's really all part of the same thing. And here in North America, it's going to be this struggle between France and England for who's going to control the, the continent, really. Now, it starts when these English fur traders, they go into western Pennsylvania, eastern Ohio in 1752. The French then start to build a bunch of forts to protect what they think is theirs. A guy you've probably never heard of before, his name is George Washington, is sent to the Ohio Territory in 1754 and 1755 to try and remove these French. It doesn't go very well. And by 1756, the British are going to declare war on the French. Now for the fighting, um, the American portion is going to go from 1757 till 1760. The European part is going to last about three years longer. But here in North America, you're going to have the British and their native allies fighting against the French and the French native allies. And the French are going to control and take over pretty much every major French outpost. All the major French cities are taken, etc., etc. By the time we get to 1763, France and their allies, England and their allies, are ready to declare peace. And the Peace of Paris, 1763, is signed in Paris. Uh, the biggest thing to know about this is France gives up all its claims in North America. France gives up its claims along the Mississippi River. France gives up its claims of Canada. And that's when Canada becomes a British territory. It also means that the different Native American groups can't play one side against the other. They can't go to the French and say, hey, what will you give me? And then go to the British and say, here's what the French offered me. Can you beat it? It just doesn't happen anymore. And then, as you've already read, the Proclamation of 1763, it's going to make colonists really angry because the colonists think, we fought for this land, we should be able to have it. But in reality, the English king says all the land to the west of the Appalachian Mountains, that's going to be reserved for Native Americans. The colonists cannot live there. We get this resistance to the British Empire that's going to form. Uh, the British Crown, they're going to say, you know what, part of this war is your fault. And because part of this war is your fault, you have to pay for it. So the king, he's going to get his prime minister, a guy named Lord Grenville, to pass the Sugar Act. And then he's going to get Lord Grenville to pass something called the Currency Act. The point of the Sugar Act is to raise money by putting a tax on sugar and to stop the smuggling of sugar from other sources. You could only buy British sugar, you couldn't buy French sugar or Spanish sugar or anything like that. The Currency Act was meant to get rid of all the colonial currency. The only currency you could use for transactions was British money. Colonial money was outlawed, it wasn't worth anything in Europe, so they didn't want to use it anymore. At almost the same time this is happening, there's this group that develops in Northern England called the Real Whigs. The Real Whigs, they're anti-powerful government, they're anti-king, they say political power corrupts, political power should be feared, and that freedom and liberty was at stake. Well, this idea is going to come to the English, or to the British colonies here in North America, and the colonists are just going to eat this idea up. They're like, this is exactly what's happening in our world right now. 1765, we get the Stamp Act. Uh, this required a tax to be paid on newspapers, pamphlets, wills, deeds, playing cards, anything that had to do with printed material. 
and the tax had to be paid in British money. It could not be paid in colonial number money. To answer to this, the Sons of Liberty is formed in 1765. It's a bunch of elite people, lawyers, merchants, tradesmen, all the people who would deal with printed material. They are against the Stamp Act. You also have this guy named James Otis Jr. who gives one of the most famous quotes in American history, although it was actually said a little differently what we remember. James Otis Jr., who is a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses, said taxation without representation is tyranny. We know it better as no taxation without representation. James Otis Jr., he was a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses, and the Virginia House of Burgesses, they're going to declare the entire Stamp Act illegal. They're going to say, since no colonial representative is in Parliament, Parliament couldn't tax. The only way to have a tax is if the people being taxed are actually represented. The last thing you have is the Stamp Act Congress. This is a group of representatives from different colonies that are going to get together. They're going to write a strongly worded letter to Parliament. Dear Parliament, we don't agree with this. Get rid of it. And surprisingly, Parliament listens to the Stamp Act Congress and they get rid of the Stamp Act. In 1766, the Stamp Act is repealed by a new prime minister, a guy named Lord Rockingham, but it's replaced by the Declaratory Act. And nobody really paid attention to the Declaratory Act at first. But what the Declaratory Act said, to make it simple, the Parliament had the authority to tax and legislate the colonies however it wanted to. Now the colonists, they're pretty much uh, fed up by this. And the colonists, they, they're starting to rise up and they're starting to get angry. In 1767, there's another new prime minister. This guy is named William Pitt. And William Pitt is going to appoint Charles Townsend to be the head of the Exchequer. Now, if you've never heard of what the Exchequer is, in British terms, that's basically the head of the Treasury. And Townsend's going to become the number one accountant, really. And Townsend, he's going to go through the books, he's going to check the money, he's going to balance everything, he's going to realize the colonists still owe money from the Seven Years' War. And he's going to create these new taxes, and he's going to get that money. So the Townsend Act, it's basically, it's going to put taxes on everything. Taxes on glass, taxes on paper, taxes on cloth, taxes on tea. Taxes on goods bought from Britain. Taxes on goods sold to Britain. There's a tax on everything. And this money was supposed to be used to pay the salaries of all the officials living in the colonies. Now, the people of Boston really don't like this. In fact, the government of Massachusetts, they send a letter to all the different colonies saying, hey, let's write another strongly worded letter. The government of Massachusetts is so told that you can't send this letter. They do. Then the other colonies are told you cannot read this letter. They do. And it just turns in this whole big mess. Part of this whole mess is the Boston Massacre. And what happens in the Boston Massacre, it's a little different than what you've probably been told in elementary school or middle school or whatever, whatever it might be. What really happens is British troops are stationed in Boston to kind of keep the peace. Now these troops, they compete with local laborers for jobs when they're off duty. And the troops aren't very friendly either. They like to stop and search people. So on March 2nd of 1770, that was a Friday, the workers attack the troops. There's not much harm done. It's no big deal. On March 5th, the workers come back and they start throwing snowballs at the troops. And in the snowballs, some people are hiding rocks. The troops are going to order, are going to be ordered to not open fire on the workers. Some of them do, and five workers are killed. 
Now, interestingly enough, John Adams, one of the founders of this country, he defends the troops and the defendants are acquitted. They're found not guilty. It's actually the workers who are found to be guilty of causing problems. But that's not what people wanted to hear. Newspapers write the story as they want. And there's this idea of massive resistance that gains support throughout the colonies. Now, the Committee of Correspondence is founded by Samuel Adams and John Adams. And the goal of this committee of correspondence was in 1772 to send letters to everybody saying, what do you have a problem with? What can we do? And this list of grievances is collected and written up and then sent to the British government. Now, the last thing that really happens is the Tea Act, which is passed in 1773. And this act was going to put a special tax on tea. And the whole purpose of this Tea Act was to save the British East India Company from going bankrupt. Now, the Br British East India Company, it was the most powerful company of its time. It was like Microsoft or Apple today, just to put it in perspective. And it was going bankrupt. The British East India Company is, in a way, what created the entire British Empire. And it was the only authorized agent to sell tea in the colonies. And any tax that was received on tea went back to the company. The Boston Tea Party happens in December of 1773. And men disguised as Native Americans are going to dump tea into Boston Harbor. And it was not just like Lipton tea bags. They were bricks of tea worth something like a million and a half dollars in today's money. So it was a lot of money. Also, there's something called the Quebec Act that's passed. It's not as important for this class. But Catholics were given religious freedom in Quebec. Some American land was given to Quebec. And the colonists are like, okay, the British government has it out for us. We need to do something. In September 1774, the first Continental Congress is going to be formed. 55 delegates from all 13 American colonies meet in Philadelphia. And they write something called the Declaration of Rights and Grievances. And what they say is that they'll obey a, quote, bona fide act of parliament, but they don't really say what the bona fide act is. At almost the same time, in April 1775, the British commander, General Thomas Gage, he was the leader of all the British troops in New England, is told to go and arrest an angry mob that was resisting the British rule. And they're met by a militia of colonial soldiers at Lexington Square. A small battle breaks out. Then the British forces march to the city of Concord where they capture weapons from the colonial militia. Well, the next day, over 20,000 militia troops are going to surround Boston and a fight is going to break out. All right, the American Revolution, it seems like a good place to put my... my um, secret word for the week <clears throat> and the secret word for today's lecture is going to be news n-e-w-s there's a lot of news happening this week and last week we're living through history with these with these protests with the the COVID-19 pandemic, you are living history right now. This will be in history books in probably 20 years. So just think about that. And your word for today, once again, is news, N-E-W-S. Okay, continuing on. This is the American Revolution. Uh, the Second Continental Congress is going to meet in Philadelphia in May of 1776. They're not yet ready to declare a revolution they actually want to find a peaceful solution there's a letter that's written to the king and a lot of people don't realize this but there's a letter that's written to the king and it's called the olive olive branch petition or specifically the declaration of the causes and necessity of taking up arms 
this olive branch petition, it is going to explain why the colonists are fighting, that they think they're just defending their rights. They're still happy to be British citizens. They just want to be equal British citizens. Well, King George III, he is angry as could be, and he orders the army to treat the colonists like open and avowed enemies. And that's really where the American Revolution truly starts. Now, it's important to know, not everybody supported the war. Only 20% of the American colonists were rebels. I'm sorry, 40%. I can do math, I promise. 40% were rebels, 20% were loyalists, and the other 40% were just kind of neutral. So there was no guarantee that a revolution was going to be successful. That is until Thomas Paine writes Common Sense. And Common Sense is a pamphlet that really helps people choose which side of the rebellion they're going to be on. Now, spoiler alert, if you're re watching this on Monday, you do have to read Common Sense this week. It's a little bit long, but it reads quickly, and it's really interesting. At least I hope you find it interesting. Now, there are a couple of things that, the, that Common Sense is going to do. It's basically a ploy or an argument for your loyalty. It's kind of like a, uh, how do you want to say? It's like a war for your mind, if you will. It's trying to get you to support the revolution. Now, Thomas Paine's Common Sense is going to be extremely popular. It's published in January of 1776, and by April of 1776, there's 100,000 copies of it out there. And back then, multiple people read things at a time. You would read Common Sense and you would pass it to somebody else and they would probably pass it to somebody else. So Common Sense and Thomas Paine are really going to be like the spark that starts the war. Now the British strategy, they're going to treat this like any other European war. Their goal is to control the cities and defeat the enemy in a military victory. Two armies going on on the battlefield and fighting. But that's not what the Americans are going to do. The American strategy is to play defense, win over people's hearts and minds, get assistance from somebody, and then just wear out the British. The Americans knew that the British government would eventually get tired of paying for the war. Now, a couple of important battles. I'm not going to go through everything because, well, quite frankly, this is not a military history class. But the Battle of Long Island and the Battle of Manhattan, those were the first two wars or battles of the war. They happened in June and July of 1776. George Washington is going to be the leader, and it's not going to go so well. The British gain control of New York City. George Washington is forced to retreat. At Trenton and Princeton, that's where Washington cra crosses the Delaware. He wins a surprise victory. And the morale for fighting just goes crazy. It goes through the roof because the American colonists are like, we might be able to do this. You also have the Saratoga campaign, which is towards the end of 1777. There's this guy named General Burgoyne. He's a British general. He marches an army out of Canada. He tries to, to take his army all the way down the Hudson River Valley to New York City. It ends in a failure. He's forced to retreat. And then you got the Winter of Valley Forge. Uh, that's the winter of 1777, 1778. It's not really a battle, but that's where the American army really begins. Um, it's really cold. It's in Pennsylvania. And <clears throat> there's lots of starvation. There's lots of disease. There's lots of malnutrition. Over 2,500 soldiers are killed. But that's also where this guy named Baron von Steuben, who is a Prussian or a German, comes, volunteers to help Washington train his army. And for the first time, Washington has a professional army that can go toe to toe against the British army. Once the French see the victory at Saratoga and see that George Washington has an army capable of fighting, that's when France gets into the war as America's ally. The last big battle is the Battle of Yorktown. Uh, Lord Cornwallis, or General Cornwallis, is chased to the coast of 
Virginia, where he thinks that the British Navy is going to resupply him and give him reinforcements. Unfortunately for him, the French Navy gets there first and cuts George or General Cornwallis off from the sea. George Washington is going to surround the British on the land, and before you know it, Cornwallis is forced to surrender. Um, and there's an interesting story here. Cornwallis refuses to surrender to Washington, and Cornwallis sends out his second command. Washington refused to accept the surrender of Cornwallis' second in command and forces Cornwallis' second in command to surrender to Washington's second in command. It's very interesting. It's a If we were in person, I'd, I'd tell you more about it, but research the surrender at Yorktown. It, it's fascinating what happens. Now, ultimately, every war ends in a treaty, and this is the Treaty of Paris, 1783. And you see here, I have listed what the 10 things are. Uh, primarily, though, it guarantees the United States is going to be a free, sovereign, and independent nation. It will no longer be part of Britain. Now, these terms overall, are they're very friendly to the United States, and that's because the British thought that the United States would come back home and rejoin with Great Britain. But, of course, 200 and something years later, that has not happened. All right, so that is your Monday video. I tried to make it as short as I could, but it's a lot of material. Uh, once again, uh, if you get a chance, go and research the Battle of Yorktown. Look at what happens when the surrender occurs and get started reading Common Sense so that way it's done for your discussions. All right, we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.